Thank you again for attending uh, today's research event. The first presentation today will be on the university budget models uh, at Purdue Northwest University. The purpose of this study, of course, is to analyze the current and proposed budget model at PNW. Um, currently, Purdue Northwest is running an incremental based budget model and they are planning on switching to the incentive-based budget model, which is a form of RCM budget models. We will commonly refer to this as either IBBM or RCM. Um, <clears throat> the other, further, the purpose of analyzing these budget models is to further understand the pros and cons of each model and investigate further the perspectives of the budget leaders at PNW and how they think about the current and proposed budget models. Just to give an outline of today's presentation, first we'll go over the trends impacting university revenue and enrollments. This is one of the motivations for the switch. Then we'll visit um, incremental, incremental budgeting itself and discuss what it is and the pros and cons, as well as the RCM model, the incentive-based budget model. Then we'll focus in on Purdue Northwest in the proposed budget model and then we'll go over the interviews that we had with PNW Budget Committee, as well as financial administration here at PNW, and also provide an overview of the financial data, showing uh, hypotheticals where we can see how both budget models would behave differently in different scenarios. Then finally, we'll summarize all of our findings on the new budget model, as well as some recommendations on the implementation of the uh, pro proposed and future budget model. And next, I would like to pass things on to Frida, who will be introducing us to the demographic and economic trends. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, before we dive in into discussing what is IBM and RCM, I would like to talk about some things that has been affecting our university revenue and enrollment. So, um, you know, university enrollment and revenue has been affected by several things. One of those would be declining birth rates, declining college age population in Lake County and United States as a whole, and as well um, de declining college enrollment and its projected estimates uh, for the next decades. Now, this graph shows student demand forecasts for regional, that is panel A, and national, that is panel B, colleges and universities. PNW belongs to the panel A. In the next 10 years, growth is expected to go up. However, around 2025, both subgroups show clear effects of the birth shortage with an acute negative change in trend. The Indiana population projection estimates uh, estimates the slow drop in the short term run when PNW's new budget model will be implemented. There is always uncertainty surround, surrounding population trends, so the graph does not account for COVID-19. College age population in 2019 has been the, slow, the lowest for two decades, around 42,000 um, students, followed by the 2007 um, year. If we compare this to, for example, 2014, which is the highest po point in the graph, we will get the difference of nearly 3,000 people. Now let's talk about what is IBM, incremental budget model. IBM is a centralized approach that heavily relies on prior allocations to determine current allocations. Year-to-year -year changes are often minimal, even in the presence of obvious need or exceptional performance. For example, underperforming colleges units continue to receive their historical allocation. Now, there are of course some advantages and disadvantages of IBM. Some of the advantages would be it's very relatively easy to administer. It's as well traditionally popular in higher education and um, it also induces some stability in year-to-year -year funding. Now about disadvantages. There's uh, little incentive to increase tuition revenue via enrollment growth because allocations are not tied to enrollment performance. 
It can also, IBM can also lead to imbalanced workloads. For example, student credit hours per faculty member can become highly asymmetric across colleges. And finally, um, logical reallocations across colleges units are often avoided because one group gains only if another one loses. That is a zero sum game. Now, what's, what is the conclusion here? IBM is ill-equipped to deal with the changes with revenue and enrollment that we are expecting in the future. That is why we are shifting to a new model. And it is called incentive-based budget model that Herminio is going to talk about next. Herminio, I'm handing over to you. Thanks, Farida. Just uh, uh, one moment. Can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, so when you when you are talking about those forecasting future, what's your uh, source of that? Because forecasting future is like a little bit tricky. Yeah, um, uh, Tyler, can you go back to that slide? Are we looking at this one? Yeah. Or uh, the ones before that, like the a couple forecast. of them, yeah. Yeah, this one is a source. Uh, it, this one was a book. It's called Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education. It was written by Nathan Grohl. And um, he has presented those um, charts in that book, which we found very interesting. Do you know, do you know anything about their methods of forecasting future? Why do we have this like sharp drop in like a number of students like after 2025? Like if you look at the both charts, we have a sharp drop after 2025. What's the reason we have that? That is a great request here, sorry. Uh, Shalush, let them present first. We'll have time for Q&A since we have three research presentations we don't want to you know we want to make sure that we uh, manage the time carefully so if you could at least uh, wait until the end of the presentation i would appreciate that thank you sure if you want to so i um as i was saying my name is arminio and i'll be giving an overall overview overall view on incremental budget model which is IBBM, and what definition is dividing the university into units to manage their budget and financial responsibility. Uh, in, in, in practice, each college will get a percentage of money equivalent to the revenue that they generate. Um, if you could, Tyler, move to disadvantage and advantage. One of the cons of IBBM is the high levels of competition. Actually, one of our case of studies um, show that the university of <clears throat> the, in the University of Lethbridge in Canada, um, they, are, they almost had a kind of civil war. And this problem inside of the university came from the high tensions from the IBBM. Now, uh, college must earn their revenues, which may rise the tension among them. Another disadvantage from IBBM is expensive and time consuming. On average, the shift from IBM to IBBM may take three years. However, um, IBBM also has some advantage like flexibility and accountability. Um, college, uh, all units are free to choose where they will allocate the money, which means that they are independent of a centralized budgetary committee. Um, when it comes to accountability, the units are responsible for managing their budget. Therefore, they cannot blame or praise anyone else in case of su success or failure. Um, now I will pass the word to my friend Jake who will talk about incentive-based budgeting at BNW. Thank you very much, Herminio. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as I said before, my name is Jake Durkis. Thank you so much for coming out to this event. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the incentive-based budgeting system, or RCM, at PNW specifically, if you can go on to the next slide. So over here, we have some uh, diagrams of the anticipated flow of funds in general 
from the old IB budgetary system and the new proposed RCM budget system that we are moving towards. Under the old IB system, all tuition and fees, state appropriations and other sources of revenue the university may acquire kind of fall into a central bucket uh, into the central administration. The central administration then proposes and implements budgets on a percent basis and divvies that out to the academic, the individual academic colleges and the support units. As And when you move on to the RCM model and their flow of funds, the major shift there is the tuition and fees, state appropriations and other sources of revenue go to the colleges first. So in a sense, the colleges directly keep a portion larger portions of the tuitions they collect. Now, once it's hit the colleges, the college will pay a flat tax rate to the central administration to support the administration's needs. And then the central administration will use those taxed funds to fund the associated support units, uh, support units such as facilities and grounds, security, that sort of thing. And over to the right-hand side of both graphs, you can see Auxiliary units. Auxiliary units would be things like housing, the bookstore, food services. Those are programs and units that are self-sustaining. They kind of support themselves. So they are unaffected between the transition and the change between the old IB model to the RCM model. It's business as usual for them. So over here, um, this is kind of a timeline of, for PNW specifically of how they plan to implement the RCM model. We're not going to go too in depth into this, but a lot of the key things you really need to look at here is they kind of ran a shadow budget in a sense where they kind of took a fiscal year's worth of data and ran it with the RCM model to see how well, how nicely it would play with our sets of scenarios. But another very useful thing to point out there is uh, we're fully anticipating implementing this new RCM system in fall of 2022. Now, uh, to start off, uh, we interviewed quite a few people uh, for this research process, and I want to give a special thanks to the budget committee here and the uh, everyone from the administration that we talked to. They were very generous with their time. So we're just going to talk about some uh, general things, general points that came up during the interviews. A lot of uh, people agreed with each other with some of these. The main reason uh, PNW is switching to this new RCM model is to cope with a declining enrollment uh, over the last several years, we touched about uh, on this before with a lot of graphs you saw from Frida. Um, higher education, there's a lot of reasons for this. Birth rates universally have been declining. So there's a lot less people going to higher education nowadays. So uh, universities need to figure out different mechanisms to better uh, budget themselves to remain successful. Uh, under the new RCM model, the decision-making authority will shift from the old way of from central administrators making the majority of financial decisions to individual colleges and their respective deans becoming the kind of chief financial decision makers with their day-to-day -day needs. Uh, in terms of allocation, there will be a 65-35% split between the College of Instruction and the College of Major for tuition revenue. Now, you may be wondering what, what does that mean, so I'll give you a short little example. Uh, my, I'm Jake Durkis. I'm a technology student. Now, every major here at PNW, no matter which college you go to, needs to take some form of an English class. So as a technology student, I take an English class. 65% of my tuition for that English class goes to the College of Chess. They handle the majority of the English classes here at PNW. However, 35% of that tuition goes to the College of Technology, since that is the college I am housed under. So that's how that split works. Hopefully that gives you a good idea. Uh, the support units, uh, such as uh, facilities and grounds and things like security, they will move to what's known as a zero-based budget model uh, funded directly by the taxes that uh, go to the central administration, funded by the colleges, and they will be those budgets will be reevaluated on an annual basis. Uh, part of the tax money that is paid to the central administration will go into what's known as a subvention fund. A subvention fund. Uh, annually, that subvention fund will approximately be around $2 million. Individual academic units are, will be able to apply for that funding. And what this fund is mainly used for is to fund and support 
new initiatives that have a really good future here in the PMW system. There's increased in, uh, interest. Uh, so you're, everyone can go in with a plan and apply for those subvention funds to support the mission of the university. Next slide, please. Uh, students directly, we found uh, from our interviews, uh, students directly will benefit from this change uh, because uh, PNW as a whole will operate on a more leaner, flexible operation. Uh, it's this new budget system re responds rapidly to changes to student needs and wants. Uh, highly successful programs, successful in the terms of popular and uh, higher student turnout and retention rates, uh, will be in, in general better funded, leading to higher success along those. Uh, more successful programs uh, and students indirectly were more will more or less choose where the funds are directed by their enrollment. Uh, this optimization allows for more potential classes, possibly and other student focused activities. Next slide please. Uh, now some concerns that came up multiple times during our interview process was uh, this RCM system has a higher degree of complexity to the old IB system. The old IB system didn't have a whole lot behind it. It was very easy to understand, but the RCM, it'll take a, a little bit for everyone to kind of get on board and fully understand how it's going on. But in the long run, in terms of efficiency, it, it is a change for the better. Um, high, it may also lead to higher levels of competition, uh, competing for potential students uh, that may or may not be in the best interest of students. Uh, there will be a slight increase on pressure on specific university uh, leaders. I'm thinking more in terms of uh, deans, since they will be the newer uh, chief financial decision makers with their unique colleges. Uh, and also, PNW is not the typical type of institution that implements an RCM model. Generally, institutions that are uh, larger in population and better funded or endowed um, tend to succeed and uh, elect to go through RCM models. So we're kind of an outlier. Um, communicating these changes with an RCM model is always a struggle, but uh, as you can see from the timeline, uh, it shouldn't be an issue, but it's still a concern, uh, making sure everyone's well informed. Next slide, please. So we're gonna move on. I'm gonna hand it over to Tyler. He's gonna present some of the data we gathered and some specific scenarios on interactions with the new RCM model. So. Uh, Thank you very much and take it away, Tyler. Thank you, Jake. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be presenting some information on some PNW data. I'm also going to walk you guys through some scenarios that we developed to kind of highlight the differences between an RCM model and the old incremental budget. So what you're looking at right now is a uh, very simplified version of the new RCM model. What we did is we took the 2019-2020 uh, PNW shadow budget and we simplified it by rounding numbers and collapsing some categories. So up on the top, you can see all the different colleges. You can see their revenues and their costs. And so we took this simplified budget and we uh, came up with some different scenarios to illustrate um, how this new model is going to work. So for our first scenario, we said uh, a college had a surplus. So in this scenario, say that chess has more revenues than expenses, so they have a surplus. And under RCM, they get to keep this surplus. And so they can uh, reinvest these funds into their college. They can either upgrade some of their existing programs or they can start new programs entirely. Now, under the old incremental budget, Chess would not get to keep this money. And so there's not a lot of incentive for Chess to, you know, try to maximize their re revenues or control their costs very well uh, in the first place. For our second scenario, we said uh, college surplus, but an overall university deficit. So in this scenario, say that the College of Business finished the year with a surplus, but uh, overall, the uh, university had a deficit, so some of the other colleges didn't do as well. Now, under the old incremental budget, uh, central administration might go and implement budget cuts across the board to deal with those decreased revenues. 
Um, and so the College of Business would lose that surplus and they would have a reduced budget for next, the next fiscal year, even though they did really well this fiscal year. But under the RCM model, the College of Business gets to keep that surplus. So that kind of deals with some of the incentives. For our third scenario, um, we wanted to illustrate how the subvention fund would work. So say that the College of Nursing had an idea for a new program, and, but they didn't have enough funds to cover the cost of implementing that new program. So under the RCM model, the College of Nursing could apply to the subvention fund. And if they were approved, they could get some extra cash to start their new program. But under the incremental budget, this type of fund doesn't, doesn't exist. So if the College of Nursing wanted to start a new program, they would have to go find money somewhere else and they would probably have to carve it out of someone else's budget. And then our final scenario would be a college deficit. So um, say that the College of Technology had a deficit because one of their programs uh, underperformed. So under the RCM model, the decision on what to do with this underperforming program would be made on a case by case basis. So say if this was the first year that uh, the program underperformed, the College of Technology might just decide to eat the costs and, you know, pay some money out of their reserves. But if the program continues to do bad, the College of Technology would have to evaluate that program to decide uh, if the program needs to be modified or dropped or Um, changed in any sort of way. So our interviews and all the research we've done, um, we found that uh, one of the things that we're recommending is that uh, there be some support and training for deans and university leaders. Um, the switch to RCM can be very demanding for deans because their role goes from a purely academic one to an academic plus management because they have to run their college and marketing and financial decisions and all the stuff that's associated with an RCM model. And so this switch can be uh, so taxing for some of those uh, senior leadership positions that the Education Advisory Board has found that Dean turnover can be as high as 90% at some of these schools. And so the most successful transitions provide support to deans to help them with this transition and to help them adjust to their added responsibilities. So we're recommending that PNW uh, set up some similar support network for their leadership. Uh, managing high competition. So the very nature of the RCM model prevent or promotes competition, but sometimes this can uh, become too much. And so uh, there's so much internal tension, so much competition, so much friction that it leads to a failure of the model uh, as the university loses sight of its overall mission. So earlier Herminio was talking about the University of Lethbridge and this was a university that implemented an RCA model, but then competition got extreme and there was lots of internal friction. And so they actually went back to the old incremental budget and their RCM model, uh, their RCM budget failed entirely. So the most successful implementations we found maintain vertical coordination between the central administration and colleges. And we also think that it might be beneficial to establish clear guidelines and procedures for reconciling units in disagreement. And then our final consideration is COVID-19. So in the very beginning, we talked about some of the uh, demographic trends that are affecting universities across the nation. And COVID-19 has only served to accelerate uh, the declining enrollment trends. So um, we said that RCM can take three to five years to put into place. And so there's some universities that are implementing RCM to cope with COVID, but uh, the pandemic will hopefully be over before uh, those changes are realized. So there, some of the universities that are doing the work to set up this new model 
uh, won't see the benefits until after COVID is over. But because PNW started the implementation process several years ago, uh, we don't think there's any, any point in waiting until after COVID because the trends are not likely to reverse and more than likely they're going to, to worsen. And so uh, RCM can make PNW better able to adapt to the overall trends uh, that uh, the nation's facing and also any post COVID effects. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Taylor uh, to conclude our presentation. Just as a final review of everything that we've gone over in today's presentation, like many other universities, PNW is strategically transitioning from the incentive based or from the incremental based budget model to the incentive based RCM budget model. The new budget model has many pros, but some potential cons such as increased competition and increased pressure to the uh, deans and other faculty with the new budget model. Of course, implementing this new budget model under COVID-19 will have many challenges, but ultimately in the face of another pandemic or some other recession, then the new budget model would be better equipped to deal with such changes. Ultimately, of course, the new proposed budget model is an innovative and flexible approach to resource allocation at PNW compared to the old budget model. And if implemented properly with con careful consideration of uh, faculty support and um, overlooking the increased uh, competition among the colleges, this can definitely be a beneficial model to the university and its students. With that, I would like to say thank you and we are definitely running short on time. So I would like to encourage everyone to write down any questions that they may have, and we will circle back at the end to take any questions for this presentation.